Ladies and gentlemen, I can't say how humbled I am when I look at the lineup of speakers to come before you today and the information and the experience, the years of experience that they have. Uh, uh, and uh, so I'm going to keep certainly my comments to a minimum because you folks are the experts and there are a number of you in the audience as well that have done a great deal of work in this area. And I think my role is to bring attention to it along with my colleagues in the House and Senate and hopefully we'll continue to do that. But let me begin by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Deborah Davis founder of the Environmental Health Trust and award-winning scientist and author of Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation. So without further delay, let me introduce Dr. Deborah Davis. Thank you. Thank you. I want to start with not with my slides, but I want to ask you, how many of you have an iPhone? Would you please take it out? I want to show you something. And I'm going to ask you to share it with those who don't have an iPhone. Would you please go to settings on your phone? And when you've got to settings, would you please nod so I'll know that you're there? Then go down to the word general, which is on your home, the opening screen. Now go to about, which is at the top of the next screen. Now, after you're at about, I want you to scroll down to something you would not normally see called legal. Click on legal. And after you've clicked on legal, click on RF exposure. And then you read the paragraph above the hyperlink, and it says, to reduce exposure, carry the phone away from the body. And the purpose of this briefing today is to explain to you what that means and give you the right to know this and tell you that legislation is being passed in a number of places and we hope will be developed here by the state of Massachusetts, the home of the real, true first Tea Party, where we can, in fact, expect that citizens will have the right to know and the consent to be freely governed because they have that right. Now, for the rest of my presentation, I would urge you to put your phone on airplane mode for two reasons. One is it would be unseemly if anyone took a call in the middle of this. But the other, more importantly, is that you will be protecting yourself because on airplane mode, you are neither sending nor receiving microwave radiation. Today, we're going to talk about the right to know. I'm going to focus on studies on children and when uh, I have a connection to the internet, I'm going to show you some appalling videos that have been recently developed showing infants in the baby bouncy chair that has been fitted with an iPad. Now, just yesterday, we met with the American Academy of Pediatrics Executive Committee on the Environment, and they are forming a chapter of the new Green Book that will be on this issue because they are appalled at the exposure that's taking place to young brains with these devices. This is a form of child abuse. You are microwave radiating a young infant brain. These are designed for infants. You put the iPad right over that of an infant. This is the iPotty. This is the iPhone baby teething rattle case. And there's also an iPad teething rattle case. And all of these are bad ideas. And the Academy of Pediatrics recommends no screen time for children under the age of two, let alone this direct proximity to devices, which, by the way, are tested 20 centimeters away from your body. So let's talk about what we know about the electromagnetic spectrum. It goes all the way from the things that would turn on light bulbs to those that can be used for x-rays or those in outer space, gamma rays. X-rays and gamma rays clearly damage the body. We know this. There's no question about it. They have high energy. Microwaves, whether for an oven, a phone, a cordless phone, or baby monitor, or a router, all use a similar frequency, about 2 billion cycles a second. They differ in the amount of power that they use, and particularly in the pulse of the signal. The microwave signal from your cell phone is pulsed. It goes erratically. Bup, 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 bup. And it's that erratic signal that scientists now understand today can damage membranes, can increase the production of heat shock proteins, and a number of other biochemical products that we know can be damaging to the human body. This just gives you an animation so you see the incredible complexity of radiation. You have to look at frequency, amplitude, and pulse. And often when you see studies that show you there's no effect, they're using a continuous wave 
which can often be therapeutic, but it's the pulse signal, weak though it is, that may be important. It's the pulse of the signal, not its power, that we are most concerned about. Just to give you an idea of what goes on in four seconds of a phone call, the, the power density is indicated on the vertical axis there. And the power density in volts per meter is lowest when you're on standby, but all the time the phone is searching for a signal from the tower because it's smart. And when you first answer the phone is when you should never hold it right next to your head. Because the phone is smart, it goes to maximum power, and that means maximum power into you because the phone antenna is symmetrical. The closer you hold it to your body, the more radiation gets into your body. It's the repeated exposure over years, over decades, that we believe is most biologically important. So those of you who are young, who've been sleeping with your phones, who've been keeping them in your pockets, right over your reproductive organs, who've been keeping them in your bra, you can stop now and your bodies will recover because you have that capacity because of DNA repair. I'm concerned about your children and those who are going to grow up as my grandchildren can with exposure to a sea of radio frequency radiation that did not exist even five years ago. Standards for cell phones were set 18 years ago and have not changed. Would you want to fly in an airplane with 18-year-old safety standards? I don't think we should be exposing ourselves and our children to wireless devices that meet these old safety codes. Lloyd's of London provides insurance to major corporations. Lloyd's of London has not insured against health damages from wireless radiating devices since 1997. That has some interesting implications, both for government and for in businesses. If you are a business and you are requiring people to use cell phones or you are exposing people to wireless radiation, then you are going to be liable for the health damages because other companies, Lloyd's of London, has not been covering that damage for close to 20 years. They say that the risk from dangerous link to EMF can be classified as an emergent risk and they classify it as one of the top six risks in the world. That's what they say in a report that can be found on our website. Now, children definitely absorb more radiation than adults. And even if they absorb the same amount, of course, a, a child is not the same as an adult. Their brains are growing more rapidly. The fetus, of course, is in the greatest danger. And cell phone manuals warn about this. And in fact, if you look at your iPad manual, it tells you to keep the antenna away from the body. But nobody looks at that. That's why it's important that you look at our newly launched website today, showthefineprint.org. That's where you can find neatly packaged all the warnings that are otherwise buried in devices today. So I'm going to just briefly show you one study done by a colleague nearby here at Yale University where they did prenatal exposure to mice that were pregnant to cell phones and they used a, just a phone that was programmed to be on so it was not, no one was talking on it and they used it throughout the three weeks that the mice take to produce a baby and these are the results. They had significantly poorer memory, they had much more hyperactivity and much more anxiety if they had been exposed throughout pregnancy to cell phone radiation. Think about that. Think about what that may mean. But I want to tell you what's happening with respect to some international groups. France, Finland, Israel, they are all advising cell phone precautions. Use a speakerphone, use the earpiece, don't keep the phone on the body in your pocket, and avoid using it in areas of weak signal. This is almost universal around the world today, and it can be found buried in the manuals, which is why we hope the legislature is going to do the next step. And I want to tell you, Professor Lawrence Lessig of Harvard Law School has an offer to you. If you pass this law, he will defend it pro bono. He and the dean at, at Yale will defend this law pro bono because he feels so strongly in the right to know here as a First Amendment specialist. Maybe that's a sign from on high. <laughs> Now, just to give you an idea of what's happening on a federal level, in Belgium and in Australia, they've passed laws and, and have issued warnings in France. 
It, but the most important is that Berkeley unanimously passed the cell phone right to know ordinance, and I believe that something like that could easily be done here. So we have lots of material we'll make available to you after, and I look forward to talking with you and we'll give you information about how to reach us. Well, thank you for the uh, opportunity to address you this afternoon. I have uh, worked my entire career in the technology sector, and as uh, our guest speakers have acknowledged, I, my last role was the president of Microsoft Canada. And during that, my time in industry, I witnessed the incredible benefits that technology can provide. I've also seen the potential risks if technology is not used appropriately. And I believe there's potential harm in the way that you, we use wireless technology and devices today. Almost three years ago, I helped form the organization Canadians for Safe Technology. C4ST is a not-for-profit, completely volunteer-based coalition of parents, citizens, and experts whose key mission is to educate and inform Canadians and their policymakers about the risk of exposure to unsafe levels of radiation from technology. Over the previous two plus years, I've had the opportunity to meet personally with over a dozen leading medical or research experts in the field of the effects of electromagnetic radiation. These experts are for institutions such as Yale, Harvard, Columbia, University of Toronto, and you've heard from one of the most esteemed experts, Dr. Deborah Davis, who is a Nobel Co. Laureate Award winner. I am convinced there is harm from wireless devices the way we use them today. I have resigned from all the technology company boards on which I previously served, and I'm dedicating primarily all my efforts to C4ST. Although we live in different countries, I believe we can agree on the following. No manufacturer or distributor of cell phones, nor any regulatory body, says that cell phones are safe. What they say is they meet all federal safety regulations. Unfortunately, our track record in North America is not stellar. We reacted very late to the harmful effects of tobacco, asbestos, BPA, thalidomide, DDT, urea formaldehyde insulation, and the list goes on. As mentioned previously by Dr. Davis, the World Health Organization in 2011 classified all wireless devices as a class 2B possible carcinogen. Lead and DDT are in that same category. Americans and Canadians have believe in the right to know. No matter what our political party, we expect our government to be transparent. And finally, this is an issue that can be supported across all party lines. In January 2015, our local federal member of parliament in Canada introduced a private member's bill called the Warning Labels for Radio Apparatus Act. In announcing the bill, our MP Terence Young said, the purpose of this bill is to protect Canadians by changing the way we think about cellular telephones, Wi-Fi, portable phones, baby monitors, and other wireless devices. By empowering them with the information they need to understand the serious risks to their health from long-term and continuous use of their devices. The bill has received support from members of parliament from all five political parties, including the health critic for the official opposition, who is a seconder on this bill. In March and April of this year, Canada's Parliamentary Health Committee held three hearings into Safety Code 6, Canada's guidelines for wireless radiation exposure. In the presentation to that committee in March, Andrew Adams, the Director General of Health Canada, acknowledged that studies exist that show harm at levels below North American standards. The committee also heard testimony from experts on links to brain cancer and breast cancer, male and female infertility, impairment to childhood development, DNA damage, effects on the eye, brain, and central nervous system, cardiovascular effects, and electrohypersensitivity. Members of the committee passed a formal motion requesting a response from Health Canada regarding its analysis of the scientific evidence. This action is very rarely taken by a parliamentary committee before it has issued a final report. We are opt optimistic that this final report, due uh, expected later in this month, will have some very, very strong recommendations and potentially even condemnation of Health Canada and its process that it uses to review the evidence. China, Russia, Italy, and Switzerland have guidelines 100 times safer than those in Canada and in the US. 
our guidelines in North America are behind other countries. January of this year, passed, France passed the following articles into law. All advertisements promoting cell phones must demonstrate a limit to the exposure of the head to radio frequencies emitted by cellular phones, example using earbuds or speaker mode. A campaign of awareness and information on the responsible and rational use of mobile devices will be conducted. A ban on the use of Wi-Fi in daycare centers and nurseries for children under three years of age. Wi-Fi must be deactivated when not in active use for digital education activities in primary schools with Wi-Fi already in place. And if for primary schools without Wi-Fi, a consultation process must be followed with the local community. And in France, primary schools include preschool ages 2 to 6 and elementary schools ages 6 to 11. In February of this year, Taiwanese lawmakers passed new legislation where pa parents face fines who allow children under the age of 2 to use a tablet or a smartphone. They also have passed legislation that youth under 18 years of age are only allowed devices for a reasonable length of time. As of March 2014, it is illegal to market cell phones to children less than seven years of age in Belgium. There are thousands of peer-reviewed published studies that show harm from wireless devices at levels below our current North American safety standards. Some of the most disturbing studies involve cancer from cell phone and portable phone use. In my capacity as a board member advising CEOs and their executive staff for the past 15 years, I have found it very important to focus on the process. It is management's job to run the company. A board member's role is primarily governance and oversight. For this reason, I feel qualified to comment on the process used to evaluate the science regarding cell phone safety. The process is broken. Our North American guidelines are stuck on Albert Einstein's theory that non-ionizing radiation cannot cause harm, or if it does, it must heat tissue. Canadian and FCC guidelines recognize only thermal effects causing harm, in other words, only if the tissue is heated. Albert Einstein passed away the same year that Steve Jobs was born. To think the science has not evolved since then is unacceptable and in my opinion, ignores the entire peer-reviewed published evidence that's available today. What I am most disappointed in, however, is the behavior of my own industry. I work, as I said, I've worked my entire career in the technology sector. When the internet became ingrained in our daily family life, I advocated for parental controls and education. When children began to exceed their parents' understanding computers, even in my own house, I help law enforcement develop the 21st century tools and tactics they now use to, to catch predators who have moved to hiding online. Now in the case of wireless radiation, the technology industry is not leading the way. It is the one who is hiding. None are taking the lead. Not Apple, not even Microsoft, my former employer. None of them have any notices clearly visible on the products we are putting in the hands of everyone and increasingly our children. To date, you have to go on a search mission, as Dr. Davis showed you, to find the safety warnings that are buried in these devices. Most individuals are not aware that there are specific warnings associated with cell phones. We are handing out a, just a sample of some of these uh, notifications that are either on the manuals or inside the, the technology. Uh, Dr. Davis talked about the, uh, the Apple warning. I want to read two more. One, uh, BlackBerry manual states, Use hands-free operation if it is available and keep the BlackBerry at least 0.98 inches from your body, including the abdomen of pregnant women and the lower abdomen of teenagers. The Samsung Galaxy 2 user manual on page 164 says, and I quote, for body-worn operation, this phone has been tested and meets FCC RF exposure guidelines when used with an accessory that contains no metal and that positions the mobile device a minimum of 1.5 centimeters from the body. Many of us don't know that cell phones are not just receiving devices. It's, they are a broadcast device as well. Every nine-tenths of a second, 
These devices send out a burst of radiation to locate the nearest cell tower. My industry's reaction to any form of legislation from any level of government in any country is predictable. We will yell long and loud about the potential impact. I don't believe there will be revenue or funding impacts. I don't believe there will be loss in productivity nor loss in competitive advantage. What will happen is what I have seen for over 35 years. There will be a lot of initial grumbling. And in my previous life, I was one of the grumblers. Then we will go to work and not only find a better solution, we'll find a cheaper solution and a safer solution. There are far too many benefits, personally, socially, and for business, for anything else to happen. I'm especially concerned about children. As was pointed out previously, children are not little adults. Their brains are not fully developed until the age of 20. Their skulls are thinner and can't block the radiation as well as an adult skull. Studies show that radiation from a cell phone penetrates 70% of the brain of a five-year-old versus 10% for an adult. There is a fundamental difference stating no evidence of harm versus saying a device is safe. Today, as we pointed out, you have to go on a search mission to find the safety warnings buried in the cell phones that all, we all use. No one in my industry is proactive in providing the information to use these devices safely. They should take their buried warning labels and display them where they are useful. Instead, they hide behind the public relations buffer of their industry association who gives the same tired excuse, our products meet federal guidelines. The time has passed when manufacturers and distributors can say they have no liability by referencing a guideline that is over 15 years out of date or that they have placed warnings somewhere in the product fine print where the buyer will never see them. We are not advocating for no technology. We are Canadians for safe technology. We must remember <clears throat> wireless devices may cause cancer, handle with care, and learn to use the technology safely. Thank you very much. Everybody has to breathe. Everybody has to drink water. And now, Everybody thinks they have to use a cell phone, and in fact, they do for all practical purposes in terms of many aspects of modern life, although that can change. So because the exposure is ubiquitous, universal, because you cannot go out in public without avoiding it, as Janet said with this fellow who has an implant, even if the risk is relatively small, the population risk is huge. You understand. All right, so for example, the risk to a smoker who smokes is an increase in lung cancer, all right? But not everybody smokes. So the population risk of smoking has gone down over time. The risk from these devices is unknown. However, the biggest risk, which Dr. Sharma's work shows, and I'm sorry you did not get a chance to see much of it, is to reproduction, and neurological development and the sorts of things that Dr. Katherine Steiner Adair has documented in her painstaking research, and I urge you to read her, her book, The Big Disconnect. It's a stunning documentation of the ways in which the digital world is impacting parenting and the lives of, of young children today. So the answer to your question is, I believe this is the largest unrecognized threat to public health in the world today. And I believe that as someone who worked on the IPCC, who worked on climate change, and understands that there are big risks out there. But the difference with this risk is something very important. This is a risk you can do something about now. You can get those phones out of your pocket. You can stop sleeping with them. You can stop having a cordless headset, uh, sorry, a cordless base station right at the base of your head when you're sleeping. You can stop using wireless monitoring for babies that is right next to the baby. If you have a seriously ill child, keep it feet away from, from the child. These are things we can do right now. Global warming is a huge problem. It's going to take years to solve it. This is a problem where if people stand up for the right to know, which you have the opportunity to do, you could do it in a week. You have the means to do it now. The cell phone companies, they already have the means to reduce radiation. 
uh, as, as Frank Clegg put it, you know, they'll grumble, but they'll do it. And in my other book, uh, When Smoke Ran Like Water, I documented how when catalytic converters were first suggested by the U.S. Congress, Lee Iacocca famously said, you'll shut down the American automobile industry. We don't have those little teeny tiny cars like they do in Japan. We've got big, powerful American cars and we won't be able to handle that. Well, then somebody actually took a big, powerful American car over to Japan and put a catalytic converter engine in it and it ran perfectly fine. And he came back kind of sheepishly admitting, yes, well, we could actually do that. And then Congress passed a law and they grumbled, but sure enough, American industry was then shortly leading the world with cleaner car engines, which are now the standard all over the world. And what we have here is a situation kind of like what we had with airbags and seatbelts. People grumbled and complained, but we eventually got them and now we have the lowest rate of fatalities from car crashes in this country's history because government did its job to protect public health and safety. So I think there's an opportunity here, and I think the risk is great, but the opportunity to do something about it is equally great.